Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Hey, the other headline of the day, we love it. It's Jamie Dimon, CEO of J.P. Morgan, uh, and his annual letter. Um, lots of things to get through on this one. You know, he says that AI could augment virtually every job. So that was sort of the one thing he did talk about. Obviously, he doesn't like lots of regulation in Basel III. So let's dig into it. Allison Williams, Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Analyst, Global Banks and Asset Managers, uh, joins us now. All right, Allison, what were some of the takeaways here? So... I think, you know, it's always interesting to hear what's on Jamie's mind. I think some things are consistent. Um, He gives his views on on regulation, which he feels like um, there definitely needs to be some changes, um, as well as the the policy and the political front. Um, You know, one of the interesting things this year was the 20-year look back. uh, It's the anniversary of the, uh, the J.P. Morgan Bank One deal. Um, yeah, as you as you may remember, Bank One was actually the buyer of, of J.P. Morgan, and uh, and I was lucky enough to be uh, at the dinner that night with the CEOs of both cool. Bank One and J.P. Morgan, and certainly uh, did not anticipate uh, what would be where we'd be, uh, you know, 20 years later, um, but did anticipate that Jamie Dimon, uh, even I think at that time, showed himself to be a patient CEO. He waited to take the job. He was selective. He took the job with Bank One. He was selective about the J.P. Morgan deal. He stored up his uh, capital um, and was in a good position at the crisis. And so, you know, today when we're seeing a lot of headlines around uh, some of his concerns, um, and again, certainly he does outline a lot of these in the annual report. It just really just puts into mind that the man, the risk manager that he is, and so. While there's a lot of headlines about his talk about inflation, uh, he's been very vocal about the the world needing to be prepared for higher rates. I think it's just a way that he does his job um, and manages his company, thinking about the downsides, thinking about the the risks out there, and and sort of always being um, prepared to be in the best position he can. All right, Allison. So those are, you know, we always look to that letter for some long-term trend issues, and he he calls out AI uh, in particular this time. How about the short-term stuff? Uh, we're going to hear about the short-term stuff this Friday with the earnings starting. What are you what are you looking for from JPM and maybe from some of the other big banks that we care about? Sure, and and you know there were a lot of call-outs about some, uh, the great job that they've been doing, the great year that they had last year, and and we really think that. This quarter, they're going to continue to, um, you know, execute on all cylinders. I think that the net interest income story, as you know, that's sort of the big thing that everyone's watching. We've had a big shift in uh, the market view on rates since the last time these banks have reported. Uh, but we think that J.P. Morgan will continue to show resilience in that net interest income and, and uh, surprise investors positively on that front. Uh, Part of that is the credit card business where it just continues to show very strong growth. And part of it is the deposit pricing, which has come in a a little bit better uh, than than expected. Um, So we think that's that's going to help JP Morgan. It's going to help Bank of America, the card side, helping JP Morgan uh, and Citigroup a little bit more. But also where we may see provisions uh, tick up, but Mm -hmm. that's not because of the weaker environment, it's more because the card loan growth continues to be strong, it's normalizing, and this tends to be the seasonally higher quarter for card losses. So um, think that we could get more resilient net interest income, but also higher provisions. Yeah, let's talk about that because last week, Marcus, Goldman Sachs' Marcus, lowered uh, the rate on its savings account, high yield savings account, which is 10 basis points, but, and I obviously use it. And I was like, dude, we haven't even had a rate cut. What are we doing? But that's clearly going to be good for these guys, but bad for me. Yeah, so, I mean, it, for, for on the deposit front, uh, you know, really a year ago, um, I, I think it became uh, big news with, with all the bank turmoil that uh, deposit prices were going up. And consumers, I think, that saw those headlines, if they hadn't already been getting the yield, they were going after it. And so the yields have gone up. Um, we, we saw the, the yields on loans go up, and then we saw the yields on deposits go up. And now we're at a place where, you know, the question is, 
will that will those deposit prices continue to go up and sort of eat away at, at the yield? The reason why banks are, or one benefit of banks, of if the rate cuts come, is that those prices will come down, as you said. But then, you know, there, for all of these banks, there is a question of, you know, the deposits and what they can do with those deposits. <clears throat> Excuse me. And there is a competitive aspect to it. And so there are times when banks are more aggressively pricing and there are times when, um, you know, as you said, for Goldman Sachs, maybe they're less aggressively pricing. Maybe they see, you know, less uh, of a need of, of what they can do with that money or balance sheet management. Because as we know, balance, there is a cost um, to capital to fund that balance sheet. That There are higher capital requirements. There are other things you can do with your capital. And so I think these all kind of go into the mix uh, of what banks are thinking. Hey, Allison, are we going to hear anything this quarter from the banks about commercial real estate and the problems it may pose for the U.S., e I guess, economy and maybe the banking system? Or, or is that just a regional bank thing? I think, you know, it, it will continue to tick up. I think it, it's, it is a broad, uh, I guess, bank thing, but the, commer the regional banks is just more important to their earnings. Um, so I was speaking before about CARD. If you look at CARD, the, the, the banks that I cover, um, you know, especially J.P. Morgan, Citi, Wells, um, and Bank of America, are tend to be over-indexed uh, to CARD, less so to commercial real estate. Of, of those four banks, Wells Fargo is really the one that, that sort of has a commercial real estate exposure similar to the regional peers. They have the largest U.S. office exposure across the banks I cover, but they also have an 8% reserve already against those loans. So they've been very conservative on that book. I think the, the newer worry, if you will, is the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, multifamily lending business. Uh, New York community really sort of brought that to light. J.P. Morgan has the closest business to that, but they've talked about some underwriting protections they have there, just in terms of how they look at rents um, and, and the way they underwrite being much more conservative. And so they've had, um, you know, very good performance in that book over a long period of time. Still, you know, people are going to look at it, but it just, it's more of, of sort of a very long-term story for the banks. I'm having a hard time getting excited about J.P. Morgan kicking off earnings on Friday. It, uh, what's going to be for me sort of and for you the biggest surprise like what are you most jazzed about watching when it comes to all the big banks all the asset managers all the private all the guys I mean I think the biggest surprise will be that net, net interest income resilience and just the fact that it does come in better than expected you know it was interesting last quarter all the banks generally beat on net interest income but guided down and so the stocks were acted you know very negatively towards that this quarter, I think there will be the resilience in the net interest income um, that could surprise to the upside. They will adjust the outlooks. Um, the latter is expected. I think the other thing um, that, that I'll be focusing on, investors are going to be focusing on, is uh, those investment banking fees. So there's been a lot of talk about um, bullishness for those fees. Um, you know, we also think that we could see a big jump in the fees, but we're still um, you know, nowhere near compared to where we were at the, the 2021. So, um, you know, you could see a big jump in fees, but the questions are going to be, you know, how are things trending? IPOs, the volumes have been good, um, but, you know, there's still a lot of questions from investors around some of the performance. We've had some good performers. Um, there have been some not so good performers. We still have uh, some valuations that, you um, you know, investors are waiting to get better. They don't want to go public um, and ha and have to mark down those investments. So I think the pipelines and the investment banking fees are going to be, um, right. I guess, one of the more exciting things this quarter, Alex. You know, uh, maybe not as exciting uh, as as we had hoped for earlier in the year. Yeah, all right, we'll see. All right, Alison Weems, thanks so much for joining us. Alison Weems, she's a senior analyst. She covers all the big uh, banks on a global basis. She does that for Bloomberg Intelligence. Before that, she alluded to, she was at uh, Morgan Stanley Investment Management on the buy side, and where she covered the banks. And of course, uh, when a couple of big banks get together, they need to court their large shareholders. And uh, Morgan Stanley Investment Management is certainly one of those. So that's why Alison was on the front lines. Uh, and when those two, uh, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, the predecessor, and uh, 
the bank from Ohio. I can't think of the name. Oh, uh, I, I bet bank she, one, bank one. I bet she's not watching the eclipse because no, she's hard she, at work. So I mean, <laughs> exactly. I'm just saying. But I'm also looking at multiple countdown clocks now. Are we counting down to the eclipse special? Or are we counting down to the actual eclipse? I don't, See, I don't I'm just see. saying this is a lot happening. <laughs> You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. This is Bloomberg Intelligence Radio. We bring you all the top analysts from all our great coverage. Uh, We cover about 2,000 companies and 130 industries worldwide. We are broadcasting to you live from our interactive broker studio right here in Midtown Manhattan. You can also check us on YouTube. So Bloomberg Intelligence has an amazing arm of analysts cover companies and themes. We also have something here at Bloomberg called Bloomberg New Energy Finance. And the idea behind it is to provide data on commodities, power, transport, industry, buildings, and agriculture, as well as new technology as we kind of build a more sustainable world, right? We know we're transitioning and we know we have to get there. And how you finance it is the huge question. And there's a big gap between like the VC things and then the the scalable stuff. And helping to finance that gap is very tricky. So we thought every Monday we would bring you uh, an amazing analyst from BNF and sort of talk through some of these issues that we're confronting. So this time we're going to talk about EV charging. So uh, Ryan Fisher is Bloomberg BNF EV charging team leader. And he joins us now uh, from London. So I guess just to start off, who are the big players in EV charging? Yeah, so some of them, uh, maybe not quite household names yet, but you've got ChargePoint um, in the US, certainly uh, people may have heard of. And um, the sentiment was pretty positive a few years ago, stock prices up, and then everything has kind of crashed down, sentiment not so great. Uh, Some of these companies have not met the targets uh, that they might have done. Um, But what we're starting to see is a few uh, companies that you, you definitely won't have heard of actually um, have started to post um, some positive profit margins. So there's like fast charger manufacturers uh, in Europe called Kempower, making the, the kind of units that can send big power to EVs and charge it fast. And then you've got some of the, the ones who do the slower power units as well. Um, and then also you've got a couple of these companies uh, that you may have heard of like ABB, uh, producing chargers as part of a portfolio. So they're selling transformers and they're sort of using that uh, as somewhat of a way to get into companies and sell some of their other products that they've got and add it on as an additional. So lots going on um, on the hardware side. Um, and then you've got operators. So these are like the companies who basically will sell the electricity to charge a vehicle. You kind of think of it like uh, filling up with petrol. Um, and uh, none of those so far are profitable, but we have seen some good signs. So uh, some of those being EBITDA positive now. Fastnet posted that, which is a, a Dutch one the other day. Um, in the US, none profitable so far, but there's a company called EVGO. Uh, you may have heard of who has th- these fast chargers. Mm-hmm. And they actually uh, basically delivered 191% more energy in 2023 than they had in 2022. So uh, good progress there. So, Ryan, where are we kind of, I guess, on a timeline of kind of getting enough charging capabilities into the system that can really support, you know, a wide adoption of EVs? It, it, it feels like we're, we're hit, we've, we've hit a speed bump here. Uh, what's the timeline, do you think, when you talk to folks in the industry? Yeah, it's an interesting one because we cover the global market. So you look at China and they installed uh, about a million of these public chargers last year um, and the US uh, uh, did sort of low tens of thousands. Uh, So there's a big difference depending on where you are in the world. Um, I think the US and Europe are more more similar in how they'll play out and Europe is maybe just five years ahead. Um, So Europe has got actually loads of competition at the moment and the story a little bit when we look at this is uh, some of the companies um, looking like competition is starting to weigh on the demand that, that, that they're delivering uh, because it's a bit monopolistic. So I want the best land as a company. and I want the best grid connection. And I want that to be somewhere that people are going and somewhere where people can buy things. Mm-hmm. Um, and they realize that, well, the demand isn't quite there yet. But if we believe in the long term trajectory of EVs, let's get in this business. Let's get those spots. So we've seen that in Europe. And I think the U.S. is just starting to tick over. Uh, the U.S. has been hugely dominated by Tesla. So uh, if you look at Tesla on the vehicle side, kind of 80 percent of these pure battery electric vehicles five years ago, uh, uh, kind of Teslas. Um, and then they also provide the supercharging. And that's kind of pushed all the competition out. But what we saw last year was uh, some of these other automakers really producing the EVs. 
um, and therefore providing a market for other people to come into. Uh, but the US slightly behind uh, basically the glo global, maybe just because Tesla has this, this dominance um, in the market. This is a super dumb question. Where does a charging operator get the power to then enable me to put a Tesla into that network? Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting one. So um, there has been a lot of these companies that are going out and they're saying, Do you know what, instead of putting two chargers in at my petrol station where the power exists, I actually now need uh, kind of 12 chargers. And in some cases, when you look at, for example, the Tesla stations, they've got like 100 chargers in one spot. Now that becomes a big grid connection. The next thing is is charging the trucks. So this could be like the same amount of power as a town. And a lot of the um, utilities are taking too long to do it. So it's like, the, how long does it take to get a permit? How long does it take um, to actually get energized? Can you make the agreements with the land leaser? All of this has kind of slowed it down. Um, but clearly, industry is trying to work together, and this has become a big topic for the automakers uh, and the, the utilities as well. Um, some of them trying to sign contracts on site. So if you imagine these companies, small fry, like, like several small meters across multiple uh, places, the utilities may be not so interested in that. But now uh, they're actually delivering a lot of demand. So as I say, looking to other markets in the US and, and China being a good example, uh, the public charges in China now deliver more energy than the whole of Ireland. So lots <laughs> wow. of energy. Uh, and therefore, uh, that becomes interesting because if you're an energy developer and you want, you're doing like solar on site next to it with a battery, and we've seen um, Watt EV, which is one of these truck charging companies, basically uh, build a station that's not connected to the grid at all. It's just got straight to the solar and a battery. So cool innovations going on there. Hey, uh, Ryan, here in the U.S., uh, EV sales have slowed materially, and a lot of people are trying to think there's a combination of reasons, price being a big, big one. And But one of those uh, drivers is just the, the lack of a fully ubiquitous charging uh, infrastructure. When you talk to your EV companies, how do they think about it? Are they concerned about the long-term demand of EVs in general? And if so, do they feel like they can be part of the solution there? Yeah, and there's definitely kind of um, differences in opinions. The the U.S. Hyundai CEO uh, saying something along the lines of today, why buy an EV from an automaker who's lobbying against EVs? <laughs> and obviously he's talking about the U.S. there. But um, you do see a difference in those that are kind of in on it and those that aren't. And I think some who, who aren't have previously been so. They've, they've committed billions. They've talked about targets. Um, and then they're starting to row it back. And some of that is is maybe because the technology is behind, uh, they can't do it as cheap as everyone else. Um, so th there's there's different reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when you look at liabilities, I don't think that's talked about enough actually. Um, some of these uh, companies have put cars out there and uh, then the batteries had a problem and they've got to recall it and that yep. could be multi-billions. So I think there's some caution as well in saying, why don't we put a few less cars out um, because then we can learn from them and we can do it later. Some of the narrative yeah. has been they're not putting the cars out because quite feasibly the, 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 like, the battery uh, operations are not up and running. But I mm -hmm. think there is other reasons. Ryan, hey, look, this was great. We really appreciate it. Uh, Ryan Fisher, uh, Bloomberg BNF, EV charging uh, head. And we'll be doing this every Monday, talking cool. about different uh, areas within uh, the energy transition. This is why Paul stuck with me, because I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm going to make him talk about all this uh, all, stuff. All this stuff. Um, but interesting, you might have like what little power centers around EV charging networks. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Uh, Ann Barry, founder and managing partner at Red Needle, uh, is joining us. Equity's doing nothing. A bond yields up a little bit. But before we get to all that fun stuff, Ann, are you watching the eclipse? Absolutely wouldn't miss it. I remember the last one seven years ago, Alex, and just standing out in Central Park with armies full of people. So I'm, I'm hoping to repeat the experience again today. It's a lot of fun. All right, so she's not eclipsed out. Fine. No. Uh, are you bond <laughs> yield out at this point? Uh, that's my way of asking, like, hey, how, high, how much higher can yields go at this point? Yeah, I've got to tell you, Alex, I've, I've for a while now stopped looking at bond yields as an indicator of where I should be putting capital to work. I just these usual indicators haven't been as consistent over the last couple of years. And so I've just really gone back to good old fashioned fundamentals, esoteric signs, looking specifically at what might be a good catalyst for the stocks uh, individually to try and see where to play right now. All right. So where are you guys as you think about just kind of M&A in general? Um, 
what's kind of your outlook here for the remainder of, of 2024? Because we've got, you know, equity markets higher, but rates are still higher as well. They are, but I do think that the actual backdrop for M&A this year has gotten a lot more interesting. If you think back over the last two years and you put yourself in the position of the boards of public companies, and I've been there, it's been a really difficult place to say yay or nay to getting deals done. We've seen a bit of an exception in, in the oil and gas space, Alex, that I know is, is your forte. And the reason for that lack of activity has been, yes, partly financing has obviously been a lot more expensive, whether it's been in, in cash deals or stock deals, but also because you just didn't want to be the board member who looked like a bit of a schmuck if you got the call wrong because the macro was just so volatile so and a lot of the key factors you want. You just, you know, you didn't want to be selling too cheaply or buying too expensively. I think things have settled down a little bit now, which gives people more confidence to go out and buy. And I, I do think that we're going to see some names forced to do to do some m a activity and specifically there are what i call these fallen angels from that 2020 2021 pandemic era darling uh, period where i think some of these names are going to have to diversify or die and it's going to force them to go and do some m a so how do you play all of that so okay if you're bond yielded out so you're looking less at that you're looking at the fundamentals you do think m a could be it sounds like a catalyst um yeah what talk to me about the sectors first in that that you want to play well, let's take a look at consumer, for example, Alex. And, you know, that's one where you've got a history, if you go back in time, where deals tended to be, first of all, they were a lot bigger. So you saw lots of mass consolidation and sort of mergers of equals. And then you had the shift towards consumer brands and food, and beauty and apparel, trying to buy these high growth challenger brands with really fast top line growth, but less of a focus on profitability. We look at what happened last year, we saw Campbell's go and buy Sobos brands, that was a $2.8 billion deal. And I think that's because in food, for example, you're going to see the fact that inflation's not gone completely. The consumers are not going to keep putting up the price increases and the cost base has seen a step function up. Organic growth on the margin level and on the top line level has slowed down. So I think that's going to force more M&A, the likes of which we started to see last year again with Campbell. One specific company, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and I'm sort of testing the thesis. I look at something, Alex, like Olaplex. Do you remember when that went public? Um, you know, when we were all sitting at home, mm -hmm. the valuation on that hair, comp hair, hair and shampoo company was absolutely astronomical. It's now trading at a fraction, single digit fraction of where it was, but it's a good cash flow business. It's got a smart backer at Advent, a private equity firm that, that knows what it's doing. That business, in my opinion, is going to have to go and buy other brands to regain the trust of the public market again. So I would look at that as a potential acquirer. It's got the means to do it. And that's the kind of thesis I find a little bit contrarian and interesting right now. Um, and talk to us about the private equity and the private credit business. How, how mm. ready are those two folks willing to commit to M&A here? It would seem like the private equity folks, they've been holding on to a lot of assets a lot longer than they probably would like to. So they have some incentive to get deals done. Are they gonna be a player? Yeah, that's a great point. That's, an, that's a terrific point. They've got an incentive to get deals done because a lot of deals um, were done six or seven years ago. So traditional private equity is now a little bit past the horizon to get out of those investments. The other piece of this is too, if you think about when a deal is done at inception, a lot of leverage is often put on these private companies. And a lot of those debt maturities are coming up. Private equity firms don't necessarily want to recapitalize them with much more expensive debt and be stuck holding them for longer. I think they'd rather sell and deal with that maturity wall. So I think you're going to have a lot of willing sellers. And, and, and I do think this, again, is going to be an opportunity where buyers, now that the macro has died down, will start sharpening their pencils, look at the cash balances they've accumulated. And I think we'll start seeing strategics perhaps being uh, a lot more active in buying private equity assets than they were before. OK, so I, I get all of this. But at what point, though, do you need to start looking at yields again? Like if we get a stronger CPI, like your thesis is sound, what if rates hit five percent <laughs> yeah look i think i think that rates have been expected to be higher for longer and i think the street's actually been re-underwriting that thesis alex for quite a long time and i think they've sort of got the past the point of sticker shock i think the, the other piece that i would say when it comes to bond yields and looking at treasuries as the peg is one of my theses coming into this year is the importance of fiscal policy for really dictating what appetite was going to be um, around a lot of these debt plays. And one thing that's been interesting to me in watching the election, which if anything is going to be one of the big influences in terms of shocks to that thesis, none of the key presidential candidates are coming out right now with much daylight between them on the fiscal policy front. Um, at least nothing concrete, although no shocks or surprises. So I, I'm just still continuing to think that bond yields, yes, they're important. Yes, that cost of financing is critical, but in terms of catalysts, to move markets, I just don't see them at this particular moment. 
So, and just as it relates to financing deals here, um, you know, these rates, they're still by historical standards, these rates are not terribly high, but for the average yes. CEO, CFO, and board member, they feel really high relative to the past decade or here. So how much yeah. of a hindrance is that to just getting deals done? I think it has been a hindrance, but I don't think that it's going to continue to be a hindrance because one thing that has changed in this narrative is a level of confidence that at some point, yes, inflation will come down and yes, interest rates will come down. Now, what obviously has changed is the pace at which that is going to take place. You remember the six rate cuts that some of the most aggressive analysts right. had on the docket for this year. It's now gone to maybe two, right? So the, the pace of decline is coming down. But if we look forward not to 2025, but we look to 2026, you know, you can see a deal being negotiated at some point towards the second half of this year. It probably won't close until 2025, by which time we hope some rate action will have taken place. And you can see corporates being a little bit more confident that there'll be a slightly lower uh, interest rate environment when it comes to actually executing against a plan to deliver deliver synergies against. So uh, again, it, you're absolutely right, higher than recent history, but, but manageable. So you mentioned consumers, uh, consumer stocks in terms of M&A. Uh, other areas that we've seen, right? We've seen a ton in, 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 in the bi biotech space, which we tend to see normally, right? Yeah. We see energy. Uh, we also hear a lot about potential software deals because uh, there's just so many software players and regional banks. Where do you think is the most likely? In terms of likely activity, I think we'll continue to see consolidation, Alex, in you know in the Permian, in the oil and gas space, where scale really is critical and where you've got these absolutely um, asset intensive companies, you need to get those benefits uh, of scale. So that's one space I think we'll continue to spend activity. I don't spend a ton of time there, I have in the past, uh, but I do think we'll see activity there. When it comes to software, um, I think that this is an interesting space. It's still very expensive. But one area that I do think the strategics will start to go shopping a little bit more aggressively is buying some of these private companies backed by venture capital, backed by growth stage equity firms, where valuations are now a bit more sensible. And there are some real buyers of choice out there. Where, you know, when I talk to the private side community in tech, Salesforce is where people want to sell their businesses to. Palo Alto Networks, if you're in cyber. Very healthy balance sheets, lots of free cash flow. And if you look back in history, and McKinsey had a very interesting piece out on that in recent weeks, programmatic M&A, which is lots of acquisitions behind a thesis rather than a really uh, one really big um, mega merger, has tended to actually generate quite good incremental shareholder returns above the average by about 200 basis points. And so I do think looking at some of those historical M&A machines who know what they're doing on integration will be interesting. Interesting. And thanks a lot. Uh, really great stuff. Really enjoy it. Have fun at the Eclipse today. <laughs> and Barry, founder, managing partner at Threadneedle, Paul. Uh, and John and um, what's your name again? John Tucker. We'll join you there <laughs> with his with his <laughs> with his welding helmet. With his we yeah, he has a welding helmet. Apparently, not glasses. Yeah, that gig didn't work out, but I kept the helmet. Because you and never know when an eclipse. You never helmet. know. You never know when you're going to need that uh, welding helmet. I want to see what your garage looks like. Yeah, you uh, I actually don't a have a garage. I have a shed, shed. Yeah. Okay. a large shed, um, and With the basement, gear. you can't even move in there. There's so many tools. <laughs> With lo uh, old scale welding back. gear. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. All right, well, let's go to someone who's probably not eclipsed out yet, and that is Julie Fine. She's Bloomberg, Texas bureau chief, and she's standing by. I mean, it's not that I don't think it's cool. It just, it's a lot. It's a lot. Are you eclipsed out? I'm getting eclipsed out. <laughs> Yesterday I was in Target and I was like in the line for self-checkout for like 20 minutes. <laughs> um, it's just so crowded here. Um, I think you, you, you think about a Super Bowl when, you know, a stadium holds roughly 100,000 people. So you probably have 200,000 people in town. Right now in the Dallas area, the mayor estimates 400,000 people really? in town. So people are coming there example. because Dallas is in the totality area? Is that the, is that the story? Dallas is totality. We get nice. totality for three <laughs> minutes and 51 seconds, to be exact. <laughs> so um, Dallas is in totality. So we have a lot of people in town, and you can certainly feel it. That, that means, I mean, to be fair, I mean, I, I may joke, but this is, there's a definite economic there impact here. Like, how much could Texas make off of this thing? Uh, a leading economist estimate, estimates over $400 million. 
for the entire state because there's areas that are in almost totality, like Austin and Houston. You've got the Hill Country. I mean, hotels are jammed. My family said to me on Friday, we should try to come in for the eclipse. And you're looking at, uh, you know, to even get here was $1,200 on Sunday. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, okay. Governor I said Hochul this is a little late to think about that. Exactly. <laughs> well, Governor Hochul, a late. The Governor Hochul for the state of New York is telling people, like, because another one is up in Buffalo and Niagara mm. Falls. The well, fun fact, that's where I'm from. Oh, so okay. I'm all <laughs> eclipsed today. And um, in Buffalo, it's supposed to be better forecast actually than here in Dallas. We're a little overcast here, but Buffalo apparently is jammed with people as well. It is actually quite interesting. If you look at like an Airbnb map, this came out on um, on X like a few uh, weeks ago, I guess, and you just saw exactly where the line was of where the eclipse was going to go, sold out uh, Airbnb. So to your point. All right, Julie, what, what else are you going to be watching? Kind of what are some of the highlights here? Well, I think there was some questions about the power grid because solar will be affected for a short period of time, but the power grid in Texas seems very prepared to handle that. So we'll be watching that. You know, we, our office is smack in the middle of downtown, so they're actually blocking entrances and exits for an hour or so. What's really interesting is we're supposed to have severe weather this evening. So obviously everybody will be paying attention to that. It'll be really interesting. And actually, you know, hopefully people are smart about when they choose to travel and come in and out of town. If there's a horrible rainstorm and everybody's kind of trying to get out of Dallas. Big D. They do that things sounds, big in Texas. That's that sounds fun. Uh, Everything's bigger here and yeah. better. <laughs> All right, yeah, I do think that the solar thing is also kind of interesting. But again, if you're prepped for it, maybe it's not that big of a deal. All right, Julie, thank you so much. Have fun. Be safe. Julie Fine Bloomberg, Texas Bureau Chief, uh, joining us there. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Uh, again, we think about where we are, where we were back in October to where we are now. S&P 500 up over 25%, just a big, big move. Big first quarter uh, as well to kind of finish that off. And we got a little bit more green here today. So the question for a lot of folks is, boy, that was quick. And did I miss that move in the market? Let's check in with Walter Todd. Uh, he does this stuff for a living. He's a president, chief investment officer, managing director at Greenwood Capital. And Walter, I'm guessing you're in South Carolina? I am. I've got my eclipse glasses ready for the uh, for the viewing later today. <laughs> and I'm guessing you're pretty happy after your lady Gamecocks last night put on a heck of a show. Yeah, congratulations. Got to give a shout out to Don Staley and the and the team for uh, for a great win, undefeated season, pretty incredible. Yes, amazing. All right, Walter, what are you telling your clients here about kind of the, these markets where they've moved, where the opportunities are? What are, what are you talking? What are, what are you saying to your clients these days? Yeah, well, as you kind of alluded to in the lead-in here, it's, it's been quite a move off the lows, and you know, it, it's this year has been a little bit uh, hard to figure out, quite honestly, for me. I mean, the, the move off the lows in October when rates peaked at five and the S&P started to to rise as rates fell, that made a lot of sense. But as we sit here today, uh, you know, up almost 10% for the first quarter for the S&P. You know, rates have risen. The expectation for Fed cuts has gone from seven to less than three. So it's a little bit puzzling to see the market kind of screaming in that with that backdrop. Having said that, you know, the reason for the rate cut push out is because economic data has been better and that should be good for earnings. I think, you know, depending on your time horizon in the very short term, it feels like this market's a little bit tired, kind of churning here. We're seeing some rotation underneath the surface. So I think you can kind of bide your time a little bit here um, and look for opportunities in the volatility that we think will, will come. Um, but again, it's it, it's it's. It yeah. reminds me of the quote from uh, Mark Twain, uh, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble, it's what you know for sure that just ain't so. Yeah, and, um, and, and Walter, kind of <laughs> that really depends on the volatility actually materializing. <laughs> what what does that volatility right. look like, and what do you think finally causes that? Yeah, well, I think we got a little bit of a peek at that last week. If you look at the action on Thursday mm -hmm. uh, from the, you know, the comments from Kashkari uh, Thursday afternoon and then the you know, geopolitical issues uh, going on in the Middle East, you saw the market drop you know, 2% basically from high to low in a couple of hours. So that's, I think, a little snapshot of what could happen. I mean, we'll see 
what happens with the CPI report uh, on Wednesday. You know, if that were to come out a little bit hot, we could see some more volatility. But you're right. I mean, it's been incredibly low volatility uh, backdrop uh, for markets really off the lows from last October. So there's no guarantee that it will emerge. But I think the, the odds are that it likely will um, as a function of probably higher rates um, being the catalyst there. Walter, what are you? Walter, what are you guys doing in the fixed income space here? I mean, I can just park myself for a two-year treasury and get 4.78%. That's not too bad. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think on, on the fixed income side, when we have managed a, you know, a good number of fixed income assets, I mean, we, we, we take a barbell approach on that, you know, as you say, you know, taking advantage of the short end, but also, you know, taking advantage of rates moving higher and starting to step out a little bit on the duration spectrum, but still staying, you know, shorter than the index. The other aspect of fixed income is corporate spreads. Those are extremely tight uh, right now. And kind of back to the, the previous point about where, where's the volatility going to come from. You really haven't seen, anytime you've seen volatility in the equity market, the little that we've seen, you really haven't seen spreads react. And so we're kind of watching that to see it kind of a, as a coincident indicator to validate any type of sell-off maybe has some legs uh, in, on the corporate bond market. So we're actually transitioning a little bit of weight out of corporates into treasuries mm -hmm. as a result of those tight spreads. Yeah, yeah, you know, you and everybody else have been waiting for those spreads to change. It's really fascinating. Um, do you think we see for the 10-year... 3% or 5% first? Mm, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> I think we, I think we can, uh, I think we could see a push back towards 5%, um, you know, in that direction, whether we, whether we clip it or not um, and, and get back to those highs from October, I'm not sure, but I think directionally we're going to move towards 5% before mm -hmm. we head back below four and, and maybe head towards three as we move through this year, because the other dynamic here is the federal government just continues to run deficits and spend, you know, have deficit spending, which has really kind of been the support for financial markets in the economy. If you look over the past several years, we've been running, you know, five percent deficits uh, year after year, which is, you know, certainly helpful to uh, to the economic environment and financial conditions. So, on the equity side here, where are you seeing opportunities here? Are you kind of all in with some of those big growth stocks that have been powering the market really for the last eighteen months? Um, you know, the Nvidia's of the world, or or are you looking for maybe some value in other spots? Yeah, for us, it's kind of a barbell. So we certainly have exposure to you know technology, not NVIDIA specifically, but other technology names uh, within the index, because that is, a, I think, a multi-year kind of growth dynamic with uh, AI, but probably getting a little bit stretched here in the short term. On the flip side, we see, also see opportunities and, and want to have some exposure to the, to the value side of the equation. So think energy, uh, materials, industrials. And that's something we've really seen over the past month is kind of this uh, emerging inflation trade mm -hmm. where you've seen you know, the commodities kind of catch uh, catch a bit here. Um, industrials have been consistently good, particularly down the cap scale. Um, so we believe you want to have a balance within the portfolio uh, between the growth and the value. You mentioned energy. Thank you very much. So how do you <laughs> want to play that? Like, what's the best way to play the recent our performance? Yeah, Alex, I know you're a big energy uh, energy fan there and follower and expert. Um, yeah, well, so within the portfolio, we have um, you know, a variety of different exposures there. So certainly on the EMP front, I think this uh, M&A that we've seen over the past year is going to continue um, as we move through the rest of this year and into 2025. We also have exposures to some of the big integrated names like Exxon and Chevron and different uh, strategies. Uh, we don't have a ton of exposure to the equipment and service space right now, but I know that's been catching, uh, you know, catching up a little bit to the to the broader energy space. So we think having a you know a broad uh, exposure within energy, and and quite frankly, you know, it's just four percent of the S and P. So you can have you know a, a pretty good overweight with just six to seven percent of the portfolio in there, and we still think this dynamic of you know Nvidia, for example, being larger than the entire energy space, just that make a whole lot of common sense to us. So we think there are opportunities in the energy space. How about in healthcare? A lot of folks are suggesting that could be a defensive area, but still some, some growth, I guess. Yeah, healthcare has been, uh, been disappointing. Uh, it's certainly disappointing. You know, it was great in 2022 when the market was off. It was, you know, lagged last year. Started to kind of emerge early this year, but has fallen back off. We see a lot of value within healthcare, um, you know, whether that be pharmaceuticals, biotech, uh, healthcare equipment, um, but but certainly has lagged the overall market. But we we definitely have a healthy weight uh, within that sector and see opportunities. One of the challenges for healthcare is it is an election year, 
uh, which tends to be a little bit of a headwind uh, for those names. Um, what don't you like right now? Like what's like verboten where you are? Yeah, so we're um, we're underweight consumer discretionary right now. Mm -hmm. um, we're underweight um, you know, real estate and utilities as interest rate sensitive uh, sectors. And we're actually slightly underweight technology, uh, which I know is a, <laughs> a, seems like a crazy yeah. thing right now. But again, we think a little bit stretched here in the short term, given the move that we've seen uh, you know, over the past 18 months in that sector. Yeah, that's so funny. It's like you, you don't want it, but you have to have it, <laughs> yeah. but it's stretched. That's a tricky spot, definitely, to be. Yep. That's why people get paid Absolutely. to do this stuff. That's true. Money. That's Probably why people. I don't do that. Well, Walter Todd, thank you so much for <laughs> joining us here. President, Chief Investment Officer, Managing Director, Greenwood Capital, uh, coming to us from the great state of South Carolina and Greenwood, South Carolina, where I guess the whole state's going nuts. Mm -hmm. I know Amy Mars is at Bloomberg News down in Washington. We chatted with her this morning. She was overcome with emotion talking about her University of South Carolina. Sports? Lady Gamecocks. Sports. Women's basketball. Yeah, no, yes. I'm kidding. I do know. <laughs> Paul's looking at me like, come on, Alex. Like, get it a little bit together. I got so, a little bit together for that. Got a little bit together. Yeah, so that was a lot of fun for those folks down there. So. But we're done with that now. We're moving on to the to the men's match, right? When's that? 9.20 tonight, so I'm not even going to see Yikers. the tip-off. 9.20? Exactly. Wait, we got an eclipse and the Final Four in one day? And you got Coach Calipari leaving Kentucky for Arkansas, perhaps the biggest news of the day. Wow. See, she has no idea. I don't. I she really don't. No this is the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast, available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live each weekday, 10 a.m. to noon Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, tune in, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.